Well, good morning, this great morning. Our Saviour is born. Jesus is born today, and that's what we're celebrating. Uh, Jesus being born is uh, Jesus coming to earth. Yeah, God of God, light of light, came to earth today, and we, that's what we're celebrating. Uh, thank you for coming, and for those at home, uh, thank you for joining us. It is an unusual time, but today is still Christmas. The coronavirus can't stop that. We will celebrate, and I, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas, and I hope that everyone has a great day today. But remember, we are celebrating our Saviour's birth. Let me pray, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you gather your people, and thank you that we can meet face to face, even though uh, restricted. But Lord, we also thank you for technology that those that are at home can join us on Zoom and later join us on YouTube. But Lord, most importantly, may the message that your son came to earth to save your creation, may we celebrate that today. May we give you glory. May we worship you together today. Amen. Our Kim is our little town of Bethlehem. Uh, you can mumble softly in your masks. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Christmas to everyone. Wasn't it difficult not to sing then? Uh, unfortunately, that's the regime we're under. Uh, just to be clear, we uh, need to wear masks. They're uh, strongly encouraged by the government and um, our Archbishop has asked us to do that as well. 
uh, no singing. And uh, eventually we're gonna all need to learn how to check in using the New South Wales government check-in. So that comes in at the beginning of the new year, but I figure we ought to get used to that. So it's not a big kerfuffle on that day. Um, we've been checking people in up, up to date, but if you can do a little bit of research about how you might be ready to do that. And of course, you don't need to do it as you arrive at the doorway, you can do it before you come. That would be, uh, that'd be helpful in smoothing things. However, that's the, uh, you know, what do you say, the procedural stuff. That's not why we're here this morning. We're here this morning. Can I uh, welcome you and uh, offer to you from John and myself and our families a very happy and holy Christmas. Whether you're gathering in person today or whether you're watching uh, on Zoom live or YouTube uh, in time, uh, it's great to be able to welcome you and say happy Christmas. Um, I uh, have just two things to share with you in terms of family news. Uh, one is about the Kingsgrove Rectory. We're getting that ready for Tom and Des Pollock and their boys to live in. And uh, we're making good progress down there. But there's still a fair bit to be done before they move in on the first. If you've got any spare time to help lay some vinyl tiles or do some uh, other stuff around the place, a little bit of painting or sanding, that'd be much appreciated. I'll be down there Monday to Thursday this coming week uh, from nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, it'd be great to see you if you have time to do that. And the other thing is that at the end of January, we're having a house party, a weekend away to help us to think through how we as a church can progress our disciple making agenda. And I'd uh, love to encourage you to come along to that. Uh, John, I think that's it for me. Over to you. Like I said earlier, today is always, and church is always about Jesus. And we're going to meet Jesus now as we read God's word and as uh, Tim speaks to us. Uh, Carolyn's going to come up to uh, read God's word to her. As she's coming up, let me pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, you, reveal, uh, you sent your son over 2,000 years ago to reveal yourself to us. Lord, we thank you that you have done that, and we thank you that that's been recorded, and um, we can read your word. So, Lord, as your word is read, may your spirit be upon us. Help us to hear, help us to listen, help us to believe. Amen. Thank you, Carol. The first reading today is from the Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 7. And starting at verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. And the second reading from the New Testament is from Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, 
he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, as we turn to your word now, would you give us the due sense of what we're doing? Uh, we're listening to your word to us, you the true and living God. And we pray that you might transform us by your spirit through this word as we meditate on it now together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it goes without saying in a year like this one, uh, Things turn out differently to our expectations. But actually, isn't that true all the time? Which of us planned the life that we've had and which of us has seen our plans fulfilled? As one wag said, when we make plans, God laughs. Uh, when things don't go to plan, this is what we do when we respond well, we accept the new reality and we move forward. And talk about accepting a new reality. Uh, imagine what things would have been like for Joseph and Mary on the news that, on receiving the news that Mary was expecting a child. And today I want to look at the uh, unexpected nature of this from the point of view of Joseph, uh, the earthly father, so it was thought of uh, Jesus. Now, in one sense, Jesus' birth was like any other child's birth, any other earthly child full of uh, uh, discomfort and pain and difficulty, uh, full of hope and fear and mess and sweat. And all those things, in one sense, were expected. But his conception, that was unique. And shocking, even. Inconceivable. And we're introduced through Matthew's passage into this crisis for Joseph. What's he going to do with the unexpected here? This is not made up, this account. What's going on is told warts and all. And uh, the question is, why? Why? But before the why, let's just revisit the what. Look at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. You see, Matthew is giving us the what. A number of things are expected and a number of things are unexpected. Uh, they didn't come together before they were married. That was an expected thing in those days. Betrothal was actually a very serious contract between families leading up to a wedding. And it was expected that couples wouldn't have sexual intimacy before the wedding. And in many cases, they didn't even meet before the wedding celebrations began. And then Mary was found to be with child. Extraordinary. Not, not expected. Before they'd come together. Now, Joseph committed to divorce quietly. Uh, we read, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And I think in one sense, this is unexpected graciousness. But as the source of the child's conception is the spirit, um, as we read, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I think, I think his graciousness is unexpected. And the Holy Spirit's the one behind the events here. And I think he's compelling Joseph to treat Mary kindly and rightly and to do this good thing that God's prepared for him in fulfilment of his plan to bring the promised Messiah. In fact, I think fulfilment is the major theme of Matthew's gospel here. That's what the genealogy at the beginning of the chapter does. 
It recalls to mind God's faithfulness in, in achieving his purposes. He hasn't given up on Israel. Um, and it's what he says in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel. Now, what Matthew is doing here, I think, is showing God's fulfillment of his promises. And Matthew's point eventually is that this one to be born in this way is the Messiah. He's the expected one. And he arrives in many ways in an unexpected way. And yet in fulfillment of God's promises. And he's the one who will rise up and eventually, as Matthew's gospel will go on to show, Jesus will exceed any of the expectations that people may have had for him. There's the expectations, there's the kind of the what. Um, but Matthew's gospel in this little part goes on to talk about the why as well. The why of these events. This is Matthew's explanation. So as we look at what Joseph does here, we see Joseph resolved and, and ready for action. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So as Joseph broods over his plans, he had competing goals. He wanted to be faithful to what God wants, but he didn't want to disgrace Mary. And I wonder if that's ever been your experience where, you, where you've got to kind of work things out. You've got different kinds of competing agendas. When you're thinking through a situation, you've got to weigh up those different directions. And what happens to Joseph at this point is that in a special kind of way, the Lord spoke to him through an angel in a dream. Now, if you're anything like me or my friends, um, we often think, why doesn't God tell me directly what he wants? Why doesn't he just make it clear? In fact, I've got a friend who said to me, he's not a Christian. He said, you know, if God wanted me to believe in him, then why doesn't he just appear right in front of me? I mean, apart from not being dressed for the occasion, he was in his stubbies and thongs at the time. Um, there are a whole bunch of things, actually, that he would want to fix up in his life before coming face to face with his maker, with the true and living God. And in the Bible, whenever anyone actually does come face to face with God, what's the first thing they do? Well, they don't say, oh, g'day, or, oh, you come to go fishing, or something like that. Uh, for example, one of Peter's, uh, Peter, one of Jesus' 12 followers, when he sees who Jesus is, says, Lord, go away from me, because I'm a sinful man. That's the reaction people have when that God actually turns up. And there's another problem with wanting God to turn up to prove himself to me. Because in the end, or to my friend, it, it makes my friend into God, doesn't it? Hop to it, God. <laughs> Come on, do what I'm saying. Which, of course, is never going to happen. Because there's one God. And it isn't me, and it isn't you, and it isn't my friend. And you know who you are if you're watching, by the way. Go back to Joseph. That God did use an angel and a dream on this occasion doesn't mean that when he wants you to know something, he's promising to do so in the same kind of way. And indeed, if he was to do that, as he did with Joseph, look at what Joseph does. When he wakes up, he still had to decide to do what the angel told him. His decision-making, his will, was still engaged. His will is not taken away by the fact that God reveals himself specially and directly in a dream. The Holy Spirit brings about his fulfilment through Joseph's will by informing him what's going on. Like us, actually. Joseph is persuaded to the position. Have a look at verse 20. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he'll save his people from their sins. Here's the explanation starting. This divine posty explains to Joseph why 
he should do what's commanded. Because this one, this child is different. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. And second, he's to have a particular name. Because he hasn't come to condemn, but to bear condemnation. And to save his people from their sins. This one will not be, unlike all of us, overcome by sin. He will overcome and so be able to save us. Now you might have thought this kind of announcement about Jesus' specialness would make life easy for Mary and Joseph. But that's not the case. And through the different Gospels, we get an occasional glimpse into how difficult things were for Mary. Simeon at the temple, for example, says a sword will pierce your heart also. She watches her son go all the way to the cross. But what Jesus will do will be redemptive. Life will be difficult for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. But Jesus' life will be redemptive. He will restore the relationship between God and his people through forgiving sins. And this is also the way that the good news works in your life, I think, I hope. The life isn't always how we think it will be, is it? It doesn't go according to my plan. In fact, that's not a bad thing to keep telling myself when things go wrong. Not my plan, your plan. When things don't go according to my plan, I worry about things. And you do too, judging from what we talk about. But God, through his word, by his spirit, amongst his people, speaks to us the good news that God saves not just others or random people out there, but you and me personally. And so we discover, as we trust him, what's truly important. Not that God will heal your disease, although he may. Not that he'll give you a pain-free life. He, he, he might, or a better house, or a job, or a loving partner, or an obedient child. That is not the good news. The good news is he will save you from your sins. His life is redemptive because he'll restore your relationship with God. But the explanation in Matthew has another part to it. In verse 23, we read that the child will have another name. Not only Jesus, which means God saves, but Emmanuel. Why is that? Well, not only does the Saviour come to save us from our sins, but he's with us. Jesus means Yahweh saves, actually. God is not against us, but for us. That's Jesus. But Emmanuel means God is not just for us, he's with us. Verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what this is saying is that God is, what God's doing in Jesus is not some kind of temporary fling, not come, some kind of you know, um, exciting idea that's come to him new. The promise of God is the actual presence of God. We're not talking about God now like he's someone outside the room, for he is with us now. He was with us in the person of Jesus in the flesh, and he is with us now by his spirit until Jesus returns when we'll see him face to face. For you see, Christianity is, is unlike any other religion in that it's a relationship with a person. It's not a set of things that you believe or actions that you do, but it's trust in a person, Jesus Christ, then, now, and forever. That is the Christmas message of Christianity. He's come near for us. You know, this makes all the difference in the way that we live now, whether it's a year that's a bit more ordinary or whether it's a year like the one we've just had. 
And frankly, who knows what this year coming is going to be like. If the news coming out of the UK at the moment is anything to go by, we're still a fair way away from having a vaccine that will be effective against COVID. But just think about how this good news of Christmas changes life now, irrespective of COVID. So as you go about your day to day, does your life consist in the quality of the lunch you're about to cook or consume? As you think about the new year coming, as you make decisions or plans, is your success in achieving those plans your measure of life's success? For those who know God's grace to us in Jesus, who know this Christmas message, his grace to us changes everything. I mean, the coronavirus is a terrible thing, but for those who know the message of Christmas, the good news of Christmas, it's not ultimate. Our Christmas might be very different to what we expected, but COVID isn't the last word. This message about Jesus, you see, brings freedom, even in lockdown. COVID is the last word, though, by the way, if you're living for yourself, if hedonism is your reason for being. You see, if you're living for what you can get out of life now, then COVID is not just an inconvenience. It's really messed with what your life is about. If there's nothing bigger in life than your own comfort, your own amassing of material things for your comfort, but even more perhaps your, your peace of mind, being able to do the things that you plan to do and have control over your life. And COVID's hit that hard, hasn't it? And friends, that's the situation of our friends who don't know this Christmas good news. They walk through the same things we walk through, but without the knowledge that Jesus saves and that God is with us. See, true peace and happiness is more than just an elusive dream. Maybe if I get enough stuff, it'll come to me. Rather, it comes through relationship with the one who was born a baby that first Christmas and gave up all he had to die to save us and who's with us now. And what that means is we don't have to save ourselves. We don't have to put on a show that we're something that we're not. We are not the answer to what's going on in the world. Trusting him is. We are not at the centre of the universe. Our pleasure is not the measure of success in life. As the, as the carol says, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the wonders of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Jesus saves, is with us, whatever we face. My friends, that is good news. In light of that good news, um, we turn now to a time of sharing in the Lord's Supper. Um, now, while uh, we're distributing things this morning, uh, Ray's going to pr play quietly for us. But as we uh, move from hearing God's word into sharing these elements of the Lord's Supper, let me introduce this time in this way.
The Apostle Paul indicates the significance of eating and drinking together in remembrance of Jesus and his sacrifice in this way. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But these promises are accompanied by a warning. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So let's confess our sins and our need for the forgiveness and cleansing made possible only by the sacrifice of God's Son. Acknowledging that we share together in the benefits of Christ's death, let's pray for genuine love and a proper regard for one another. Gracious Lord, we're not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your son's death for us. Renew us in your service and help us to love one another as members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We thank you, Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father. Grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And after the meal, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. We're going to hand out a little cup of juice and a cup of bread. That's our COVID safe way of doing things. And uh, once we've distributed those to everybody who'd like to take part, then I'll come back up here and we'll complete our time together. We'll all eat and drink at the same time. So you might like to use the next little while while Ray plays quietly uh, for reflection or prayer or thanksgiving. And uh, uh, John's going to assist me. Thanks.
the night before he died, Jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to continue our time of prayer now. Uh, Kathy's going to lead us in that. Good morning and happy Christmas, everyone. Um, um, some of the ideas in this prayer have come from the end of uh, Hebrews 12, if you are interested in reading it later. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we praise you for being an almighty God, for your work of creation, your works of rescue, your big and your generous promises, and your faithfulness to those promises. And particularly today, we praise and thank you for the incarnation, for sending Jesus clothed in the same flesh as we have now. And this Jesus who willingly gave up his power, his rights, his security and his comfort of sitting at your right hand in heaven, to come to earth in poverty, in weakness, in insecurity, who endured rejection and scorn and death in order that he might be a perfect sacrifice, substituting for our souls. Father, this year has seen the world and our lives shaken by COVID, by conflict, and the results of ours and others' sins. We confess that we have at times been shaken by the loss of our security and comfort. We confess that in so many areas of our lives, we hold tightly to wanting to be the captain of our souls, to be running our lives without reference to you. And sometimes we even fool ourselves that we are. Thank you for the reminders that all of your creation can be shaken and will be shaken, but that you and your kingdom will remain forever. We ask that imperfect as we are, you might be transforming us from the inside out to conform to the likeness of your son, Jesus. Please change our hearts to desire that your name and your glory might be more important to us than anything the world can offer. Please strengthen and comfort those of us who are feeling weak at the moment. We name in our hearts now those known to us suffering physical and mental distress at this time. We especially bring before you Ron Dawes in his considerable pain and ask that you might bring relief and an operation soon. We remember our sister Seti and we pray that she and her husband can be reunited and until that time that the schemes of man and of the devil may not shake their confidence in you. We ask that we might grow in love for those around us who face an eternity without you. Please give us boldness to be known as your people and to seek your praise more than that of the world's. May we never be ashamed of you um, in any context that we live. Open our eyes to the harvest fields around us 
And may we be privileged to be some of your harvesters. Please be preparing our new youth minister, Tom, and his wife, Des, to disciple young men and women for a lifetime of service to you. We pray for our safety, not safety from COVID and the world, and not through vaccines or in social distancing, but to find safety in your strong arms, in you as the rock of ages. We worship you with reverence and awe, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that nothing in this world or the devil or our sin can destroy. Thank you for this hope that is the anchor for our souls. Praise be to Jesus. Amen. Friends, today is a special day. It is Christmas Day and we do celebrate 
the coming of Jesus. But on the other hand, as followers of Jesus, there's three days that always should be our every day. The day Jesus came, Christmas Day, Easter, when Jesus died and rose again, and when Jesus comes back. We should live every day knowing those three days. Friends, today, as you enjoy lunch and dinner with friends and families and you're coming across, can I urge you to be a good ambassador for Jesus? Love one another. Love those that don't know Jesus yet. Be a testament to how good God is to us. Just on another note, we will be here on Sunday at 9.30, not 9 o'clock. Um, there is no evening services until further notice um, towards the end of January, but so 9.30 this Sunday. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son and what that means for us and the whole world. Help us to live knowing that Jesus is Lord and that we come to him. And when we see him, we can't but help adore him and worship him. Help us to live our lives daily, knowing that Jesus is our Lord. And especially today, Lord, as we meet with friends, as we uh, celebrate together, may we uh, continue the work that Jesus has started until he returns. Amen. Amen. Have a Merry Christmas and it's great being with you this morning.